virtual pre-budget forum hosted by the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago in collaboration with Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. This morning, I have the pleasure of co-hosting along with the Chief Operating Officer of the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago, Ms. Diane Joseph. Good morning, Ms. Joseph. Good morning, Colin. Good morning to our presenters. Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region. Sign on, signing on to our first pre-budget forum. We will start with the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, fellow cooperators, ladies and gentlemen. Now, please join us as we open with the credit union prayer. Please join me as I say the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there's hatred, let me so love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that you receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you very much, Colin. And a pleasant good morning to all again. As the Chief Operating Officer of the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this pre-budget forum. We decided as the National Umbrella Body for Credit Unions in Trinidad and Tobago to host a pre-budget rather than a post-budget forum so that our leaders, our governors, will hear our views and our opinions and will have the time to input our recommendations in their budgetary assumptions for the fiscal period 2020 to 2021. It is indeed a time of mixed feelings, some concern and others with regard to our country's economic challenges, the need to attract investment to Trinidad and Tobago or investors to Trinidad and Tobago, the future of our young people. And we need to consider what we are doing to ensure that the young people survive this harsh life. And we want to be sure as well that we can answer the question, are we thinking about the effects on our adults only, or are we taking a minute to study the impact on our young people as well? As credit unions, we consider ourselves to be the best vehicle to be used at all levels to lend financial and social support, to do our work in a manner that fully adds value to our membership. 
we have the place that members can come in as ordinary people and feel comfortable where they can come in and feel at home. So there must be a higher level of collaboration with us at the national level to ensure equity in the financial marketplace so that we are not denied any opportunity to play our role effectively in Trinidad and Tobago. We believe that it is the right time to put our best foot forward as credit unions. COVID-19 has now changed the world. It has changed many of us. It has made a few happy as some businesses are booming because of the product that they offer. But the majority of us cannot say the same. Unemployment is rising. Frustration is mounting and the impact is being felt worldwide. We must therefore, as leaders within the credit union movement and within the national community, put our hearts together, not only our heads, and seek to come up with answers to our country's problems with the aim of helping our people, helping our economy, and to get the best result. If you only manage your economy, that will not help us. You have to manage, but at the same time, we need to grow our economy. If we only manage and not grow, it means that we will run out of money. We will run out of foreign exchange. We will have lots of challenges and it can just further our problems. And that will be a very painful experience. And hence today, as a league and the Cipriani College, we have what we consider to be the best mix of talents on our panel to tell us as candid as possible all that we need to know. So let me bring on Mr. Bartholomew now to bring greetings on behalf of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies after which I will bring on our first speaker. Mr. Bartholomew, please. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. And in that same spirit and in that vein, I welcome all participants here this morning to this very timely discussion where at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, we are, we are deeply and heavily invested. On behalf of the Board of Governors, and our director, Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry. I thank you all for tuning in here this morning. And as we look forward to a robust and very productive, meaningful and intentional discussion. Part of the strategic direction of the Cipriani College is that of the engagement of stakeholders and the credit union movement and by extension, the cooperative movement is one of those key stakeholders which the college consistently looks to engage. At the college, we are focused on the empowerment of working people, particularly along the lines of economic and social empowerment. And we do that through education. And we are heavily committed to this objective and this morning, as we focus on the economy, I think the discussion is extremely timely in addressing those needs, particularly in an era which is really unprecedented. And we look forward to the contributions of the presenters here this morning and all the engagement we will have with the participants. So thank you very much. And Ms. Joseph will take you into the presentations. Thank you, Colin. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our very own league president, Mr. Joseph Remy, who is ready and anxious to deliver on behalf of the credit union movement in Trinidad and Tobago, and to share with you our 2020-2021 expectations for credit unions. Mr. Remy, welcome and good morning. Hi, good morning to you, Diane, and good morning to the wide diaspora, those who are listening, those who are viewing, those who are streaming 
and, and it's really a pleasure and it's a privilege for me as the president of the Cooperative Credit Union League to start off this first um, series of pre budget web um, seminars that the Credit Union League is embarking on. Historically, we, as Ms. Joseph said, we normally would participate jointly with the Oilfield Workers Trade Union in a post budget forum. And we felt that there was a vacuum with respect to pre budget deliberations and discussions. And, and we felt as the umbrella body, particularly in, against the background of COVID-19 and, and the role that the cooperative movement would have to play now more than ever in providing that buffer for our members and the wider citizenry, that we should engage in this very important um, discussion where we will get different ideas. We hope that um, at the end of the day that our voices would be heard and that the deliberations today will resonate enough to have some kind of input into the budget presentation that is due sometime later this month. We anticipate that it is going to be a challenging period for anybody who is going to present a budget against the background that they have to face with the, the, the diminishing economic returns based on the impact on the economy by COVID-19. And as such, we would really want to ensure that at the end of the day, the cooperative credit union movement will play that important role in national development. It is also held against the backdrop of our involvement over the last few years based on our strong advocacy with respect to making contributions towards national development. And it's against that background I would want to start my presentation by looking, you know, just giving a snippet at what happened in the past relative to budget presentations. And it is important for us to understand where we are coming from and where we are going because when we know where we are coming from, we have a clear idea of what we want to do going forward. So I would look at what happens in the past with, with um, other budget presentations and how it would have done, how it would have affected us in terms of how we dealt with some of the inputs that we made towards those budget presentations. So let's look at what happened in the past. And I just went back to about five, five to six years. I went to 2014 and looked at see what exactly they had in the budget presentation at that year. And, and really and truly, we felt that some successive governments did not pay particular attention to the role that cooperative credit unions play in economic development, social development in Trinidad and Tobago. So this is the excerpt from 2014 budget presentation. And it's a very limited excerpt. One sentence that was highlighted, and all it spoke to is the fact that the government of the day intended to lay in parliament a credit union bill. And then when you go to 2015, it talks about, again, the same issue of legislation. And it says that subsequent to the passage, we shall lay. So again, another promise in terms of what was supposed to have happened with respect to cooperative credit union legislation. And then we go to 2016. And again, the emphasis is on credit union legislation, but nothing tangible would have happened. To date, many pieces of legislation, again, I highlighted that, have not been reviewed. And then, then it went on to make another promise. We will correct this anomaly as a matter of priority. We are into 2020, and I'm not sure this anomaly has been corrected. So we are still at the same place with respect to legislation for credit unions. And then we go to 2017. And again, a new government in place now and a new uh, Minister of Finance is making a presentation. And it says, further, we are strengthening. And again, the operative words here, the legislative framework is expected to be introduced in Parliament in financial year 2017. So again, more promises to the movement with respect to budget expectations. In 2018 and 2019, if you're looking for anything on the screen, you will not see anything because they did not make any mention of the Cooperative Credit Union League or the movement whatsoever in the budget presentation of 2018 and 2019. Notwithstanding that, during that period in 2018, we would have started to engage the then government, the, the government now, in discussions relative to the role that credit unions can play in national development. And, and that led to us having some kind of representation in the 2020 budget presentation. And it was a, a longer, it was a paragraph this time. It wasn't just a sentence, you know. And it says that I propose to take steps to put in place the appropriate machinery to provide for the payment of utility bills by cooperative societies and credit union. And then it talked about the extensive discussion that we would have engaged in with the government. There was a cabinet appointed committee 
that was led by Mr. Robert Lee Hunt, the then Minister of Public Utilities, and they engage in discussion with the movement and the wider credit union movement on ways that we could en enhance the whole national economic development of Trinidad and Tobago. So this was what was stated in the budget presentation of 2020. But coming out of those discussions, there would have been some agreed items. And, and what we are still waiting to see is the, is the implementation of those agreed items. And number one on the agenda is the fact that credit unions should be allowed to provide services to their members for the payments of utility bill. If we go back, if we go back, you will see that that was made mention of in the 2020 budget presentation. So we were expecting that some kind of machinery and some kind of systems would have been put in place to ensure that we'd have realized that. So that we are talking still about the issue of credit unions being provided with the ability to do payment of utility bills for and on behalf of their members. I would really like to see the day when I would want to, I would go into my credit union and pay my electricity bill, my B Mobile bill, or whatever utility bill that is available, WASA and all those other things, without having the hassle of going to the commercial banks, because that is what the credit unions are there to provide for, that kind of service to its members. One of the things we also agreed on is that in terms of our regulator, the Cooperative Development Division, the CDD, was supposed to be immediately strengthened to ensure that they would be in a position to provide the requisite services to the wider cooperative credit union movement. We'd have had mirrored of instances, and we are still having it, where our members are applying for mortgages and they have to go through the commissioner's office for approval. And we are being given pushback on the basis of lack of resources. We also have situations where credit unions wanting to engage in investment opportunities, particularly in a period where the economy is on a downslide, and you find that the uptake of loans by members has been reduced drastically. And as such, credit unions are looking for other investment opportunities. And then the time it takes to get those investments approved at the office because of lack of resources. We raised those things in those discussions, and there was a an agreement, not a commitment or a, a promise, there was an agreement that this thing should have been done so that the commissioner's office would be in a much better position to provide the necessary resources to us. Then we had some very critical agreed items. We talk about the regulatory, the regulations, and that the regulation should be for financial and non-financial um, cooperatives. There should be an independent authority to regulate both financial and non-financial cooperatives, inclusive of credit unions. We also agree that there should be mandatory deposit insurance. How that is going to be rolled out is on the basis of ensuring that the existing deposit insurance system would be utilized or that there could be um, one of the um, secondary bodies that we have could be in a position to provide it once the members agree. But the critical issue here is having mandatory deposit insurance. In terms of the governance structure of the authority, we agreed in principle at that time that there should be a board that should head the authority comprising of seven members, three members coming from the cooperative sector, three mem four members by the government, but inclusive in that four members would have been the chairman to be appointed by the government. In terms of funding for this new authority, we said that the revenue that would have been generated by the authority via contributions from credit union would be one of the means of source funding. But in the initial stages, once the regulatory positions have been agreed upon, that the allocation, the subvention allocation that goes now to the Cooperative Development Division will be now redirected to fund the authority to ensure that the operations are run smoothly. We had to work out the mechanics of the kind of contribution that credit unions would have to make towards the funding of the authority. And then we talk about some immediate short-term met, met, uh, met matters, which would have been the immediate strengthening of the existing Commissioner um, Cooperative Development Division, as was mentioned early on. And then we talk about something in Trinidad. You know, when we say we have low-hanging fruits in Trinidad or in the Caribbean region, we talk about fruits that are easily accessible and you could pick with very with much ease. 
But it appears that in Trinidad, in terms of cup credit union legislation, low-hanging fruits are very few and far apart. And it appears that the persons who are attempting to pick that fruit are very short. So, you know, we're having a challenge in getting to those low-hanging fruits. So one of the first things we mentioned was the granting of the authority to credit union stake in cash government checks. We said that should be something that should be given priority. They said that when they put the legislative framework with respect to the authority in place, those things would be brought on board. We are still advocating that that is critically important at this time. And I show the one of our presenters later down the road, who would have sat in the chair of Minister of Finance some years ago, would be very familiar with this request by the credit union because this is not of recent vintage. This is something that we have been clamoring for quite a long time. With the second item too, enabling credit unions to assign members' salaries, you know, pensions and superannuation benefits, particularly from government agencies. We have a situation where government retirees, when they have their pension allocation, they have to send it to the commercial banks. And we are saying, no, that should be allowed to come to their credit union. That's their constitutional right to decide where they would want their rightful benefits to be assigned to. And we are saying that we should be moving towards that particular direction. Another low-hanging fruit, we are saying that while they would have satisfied part of the requirement, because there was a push to amend the Cooperative Societies Act, Section 41.3, to talk about the beneficiary, what they would have been entitled to upon the death of a member, in the past, it was $5,000. So if I am the legal beneficiary of the estate of my parent, when, that, when my parent dies, I am only entitled to have access to $5,000 in the first instance. And thereafter, I'll have to go through the whole legal process, letters of administration, and the costs for legal fees are really exorbitant, and it eats away at the asset base of that estate that would have been left. And as such, we felt it was necessary to have an amendment. We asked that it should go to the full estate. What we saw happening was a piecemeal thing that they went to $50,000. We are once again demanding that this should go the way how it is in the national sphere, also in the regional sphere, where the legislation provides for the full estate to be made accessible to the, um, to the person who is the beneficiary once all the legal instruments are in place up front. We are looking at some fiscal measures that we would like to see implemented in this year's budget. One of the things we discussed when we were at the table with the cabinet appointed committee was the establishment of a technical assistance fund. And, and that now we have, we re tweak, we tweak that again, based on the fact that we are now in a COVID-19 situation. So we talk about the technical assistance fund, but we feel now more than ever because of the impact of COVID-19 on the employment um, relationship with a lot of our members, we believe that this fund is more than necessary now because we are talking about developmental opportunities for retrenched members resulting from the impact of COVID-19. That will necessitate new skills and training, particularly where the government trusts is to go to a digitalized economy, particularly in the new dispensation. So we are very strong in terms of advocating for that technical fund and we will hope that there should be some allocation being made because it's not a giveaway kind of situation it is an investment for future development of the country's economy we are also talking about the development again some kind of allocation to the cipriani college of labor and cooperative studies to allow the college to partner with the credit union league so that we could deepen the educational outreach to the cooperatives um, of the cooperative sector through the use of mobile education units or caravans. Let us go out into the remote areas of the country and spread the gospel of the cooperative uh, movement, spread the gospel of the cooperative business model, particularly because it abuses values such as cooperativism, collectivism, camaraderie, working together, which are all now very prominent in the face of COVID-19. So we'd like to see some allocation made to Cipriani so that they could go on extend the outreach programs by allowing them to have these mobile caravans that will carry the educational far. And, and we are talking about the government now partnering with the Cooperative Credit Union League as the umbrella body for credit unions. And this is a very simple task we believe the government could do, facilitate the access to a 
piece of land for the league to establish its headquarters so that we could enhance our training and developmental opportunities and then we could deepen the cooperative business model so that we could contribute immensely to national development as envisaged by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. We are also looking at funding for the strengthening of the cooperative development division and the preliminary work because there has to be some allocation for the setting up of the new authority. And we believe that there should be some work that should start immediately because the longer you take to get this set up is the longer we'll have to run with the old legislation. And then we'll have to look at amendment to the old legislation, which may place us in some kind of disadvantageous position. So we are saying there should be some allocation in this budget through the subvention to the Cooperative Development Division that will talk about getting the right resources, one, to strengthen the division, and two, to set up the framework for the preliminary work that will go towards the new cooperative authority. And then out on the social measure aspect, and we have been clamoring for this because we believe that because of the demographics of the movement, if you look through the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago, and I always talk about the network in Tobago where Tobago has a stronger community credit union outreach than in Trinidad, where Trinidad has a hybrid between community and the industry. We believe that the credit union branch network should be used as a distribution channel for government social programs so that the people who have to access those social programs, particularly persons in rural communities, don't have to travel miles to go to the commercial banking sector or the network to have access to those measures. And then particularly in COVID-19, where some of those banks would have closed down some of those remote branches, we are saying that the credit union movement, its branch network should be used as a distribution channel to make the access to the social programs much more easy, easy for the persons who have to do it, do it. Now, when we were talking about the last set of budget um, presentations, most of the emphasis would have been on the legislative agenda. And I would want to posit on behalf of the League, and we have been very strong working together with the cooperative, um, wider cooperative movement, and looking at a, a, a perspective for the new legislation. We just don't want legislation because you say there's supposed to be legislation. And we believe that the legislation is supposed to have some kind of basis and some kind of foundation. We are holding on to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and, and the United Nations, the General Assembly of the UN had suggested that cooperatives should be a major contributor to the achievement of these Sustainable Developmental Goals. And as such, we believe that should be the perspective that we, we look at that in terms of developing new legislation going forward. We also believe that the government has a responsibility to facilitate a supportive and progressive policy legislative environment. And again, it is going to imbue and enhance and embolden the whole cooperative philosophy and the tenets of the movement. And then the policy perspective, we are saying that it is important for the government to support this, to ensure that credit unions continue to contribute optimally to the advancement of the sector and, and in particularly in terms of the socio-economic development. And then the government would be instrumental in providing an enabling environment for credit unions to thrive and therefore advance the national development through an effective tripartite construct. And I am very strong and the league is very strong in its involvement in tripartism because a lot of times when we talk tripartism in Trinidad and Tobago is just government, business and labor. The cooperatives, the credit union sector has over 600,000 members and we have an asset base of over $16 billion. And we believe we deserve to have a place in any kind of multi-partite discussion. It don't have to be tripartite anymore. It could be multi-partite. So we are making a, a, a call for this to be a policy position included. And then we talk about the focus of the legislation. And again, based on the, our submission, we believe that it should be in terms of transformative, you know, and, and, and looking at the dynamic role you played over the last 70 years, the legislation, we believe it must improve on the role of credit unions in providing for the mobilization of, mobilization of capital. You know what I mean? Particularly among the low income, income groups and making resources available to them in ways that redound to the nation's development. And then we talk about another focus of the legislation. 
we said that this must contribute to equitable growth and transformation of the economy and society. And we believe the legislation should be innovative enough, you know, to facilitate secondary bodies and structures to allow the movement itself, the cooperative credit union movement, to contribute to the development of finance, the growth of small and medium enterprises, which we believe is critical post-COVID now for generating employment opportunities and reducing, reducing your foreign exchange drain. Because what we would want to see small and medium enterprises earning foreign exchange, creating employment opportunities and reducing the foreign exchange drain so that we could have more resources available for the de development. And we believe modern legislation has to be acknowledged for its capacity to contribute to sustainable development and inclusive growth. And, and finally, we are very strong on this. And you know, I save this for last because we verily believe that in the creation of the cooperative credit union movement by Dr. Williams, when they had this vision for the role of the cooperative sector in national development, there was a Ministry of Labor and Cooperative Development. And we have seen different incarnation of that, that, that role in terms of supervising credit unions. And we are demanding, and I'm using the word demanding very strongly here, that there should be a reconsideration of the ministerial alignment of the cooperative um, movement. And there should be some ministerial responsibility because we believe that the cooperative movement has a critical role to play now more than ever in the economic development of Trinidad and Tobago post COVID-19. And again, I would want to make an appeal to the Minister of Finance, the Prime Minister. We are not sure exactly where we report to, and we will hope at this time, we'll get some clarity in terms of that reporting relationship. And, and brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I came to the end of my presentation. I hope that I would have given you enough to engage in some robust discussion thereafter, so we can move this whole movement of the people in a forward direction to contribute towards the economic development of Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks very much, Colin, and I turn back to you, Colin and Diane. Thank you very much, Mr. Remy. A uh, very insightful, thought-provoking, and <laughs> in addition to thought-provoking, very provocative. I think um, particularly the focus on the legislative and policy perspectives really really positions this discussion very well this morning. And I, I like the perspective of the low-hanging fruit, particularly being nationals of Trinidad and Tobago. We really don't allow low-hanging fruit to escape. So <laughs> as we, 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 we progress in the discussion, yes, we, we, will, we will go after those low-hanging fruit. I really appreciate your contribution. Thank you very much, Mr. Remy. And those of you who are in our chat here this morning, please feel free to leave your questions there for after the presentations where we will be addressing those questions and those concerns. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Winford James, who is no stranger to the credit union movement and is also, as Mr. Remy, a, a national figurehead um in the movement he is usually referred to and he holds the portfolios of the president of mount pleasant credit union in tobago as well as having served as a former president of the credit union league of trinidad and tobago from the national perspective he is also a political analyst and he he has always enjoyed, you know, receiving critical acclaim for his contribution. So this morning, we are really privileged to have Dr. Winford James. And this morning, he will wear the cap of a political analyst as he addresses the topic of the disadvantaged young and budget 2021. So Dr. James, the floor is now yours, sir. Thank you, Colin. Thank you also to Madam Co-Chair, Diane Joseph, COO of the League. And I must start off by recognizing that I have a Caribbean audience, a Trinidad and Tobago audience, a Caribbean audience, 
and an audience beyond the Caribbean. So greetings and salutations and toasts to my audience. I want to recognize um, the contribution of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago. The collaboration of these two groups that has made this um, seminar, workshop, if you will, possible. And we are starting off this morning against the background of uh, a landslide victory for the JLP in Jamaica, with a landslide victory by Andrew Holness and his incumbent JLP in Jamaica. And they have gained 16 more seats. So congratulations to Mr. Holness and his party. And we want to wish the PNP, Dr. Peter Phillips' PNP, uh, better fortunes the next time around. Having said that, now I want to share my screen and, and get this show, at least my part of it, on the road. Um, hope I can get the right file. <clears throat> Good. You should be seeing my screen now. Good. And um, Colin has told you what the topic is, and it's in front of you there. So let's define some terms as we proceed. What do I mean by the disadvantaged young? Who are they? Well, generally, it's people 24 years and younger. They belong to poor households. Most of the poor households belong to poor communities. Poor households are characterized by single females as heads. They are characterized by the absence of fathers Typically, too many children to properly take care of and supervise. Parents are forced to trade off care for their children and an income from holding down a job. They are characterized by the inability of the typical family, typical household, to properly feed, clothe, and provide rooms for and help children with their schoolwork particularly homework, inadequate income, substandard, substandard educational resources, limited amounts of other capital assets, other income generating capital assets, including good health, housing for business, and political power. They are characterized by low self-esteem, these households. And as I said, they live in poor communities, poor disadvantaged communities, where you have these same poor uh, households, but you also have an absence of or rundown of or, or, or interest, absence of infrastructure and rundown infrastructure, in fact, and and or utilities, roads, water, electricity, absent or inadequate sport recreational, educational, and administrative facilities, absence or underdevelopment of business enterprises and job creating capacity, absence of or indifference um, in and in for informality in, in respect of community leadership. Low quality schooling is a feature. As a result of low quality schooling, we have these results among others. Low and limited range of job opportunities, occupational choices, business opportunities. There's also an easy recourse to crime for economic opportunity. As a result of all that I've said so far, 
community life is stagnated. So the critical question is, how does a budget, a national budget, cater to and fix these conditions in poor, disadvantaged communities? Well, we can go back to 2020 and see what the budget proposes solutions. And let me take the opportunity to wish that Mr. Henry, Mr. Remy has been able to pass on his ideas to the government in their preparation of the budget. I hope that has happened. But I myself went back to different budget solutions and I chose 2020 and um, I picked out some of the solutions presented in 2020. Um, so let's see how the 20 budget um, visualized that the problems could be solved. Introduction of a food support program. Introduction, I picked out about 15 of them. Introduction of the concept of home gardening. Continuation of the school nutrition program. Continuation of family services such as counseling, referrals, advocacy, co-parenting, advisory services, assistance to 19,304 poor and vulnerable people in the form of a $150 increase in the monthly value of the public assistance grant. Continuation of family services. As I already gave you that. It was a repetition. A launch of a mediation mobile unit. Joe talked about um, caravans to go into the countryside, in Trinidad and Tobago and across the Caribbean. Development of a student tracking system aimed in part at reporting on factors associated with achievement levels, initiatives in the tech vox sector and science education aimed at improving and promoting quality education for citizens, continuation of the community education short skills program aimed at capacity building in poverty alleviation. A budgeted allocation for social programming and infrastructure of $10.74 billion, right? Plans that include a review of standards for regulating early childhood and care education, launch of the Institute of Culinary Affairs, right? Uh, girls in ICT project establishment of a national apprentice, apprenticeship system, and so on and so on. So, many of these initiatives, of course, are a wish list, and uh, you might even think that they are a wishful list that uh, has not seen the light of day. They all make no distinction between depressed, disadvantaged communities and other better-off communities. They ignore the asset and business development needs of poor communities and households, and they are not focused on poor, holds, poor households per se. They do not involve the community in the decision-making and governance process, are top-down and authoritarian rather than bottom-up and participatory. They have not solved and are not solving the problems of the communities that we have just spoken about in a sustainably transformative way. Now, since multi-generational poverty, I put it that way because poverty in these uh, areas is multi-generational. It persists from generation to generation. And people are locked into a vicious cycle of hopelessness and despair. So since that kind of poverty is the absence of assets that could generate wealth in the early years, and since, since such assets, for example, high quality education, health, 
good health. Housing, as I said before, for business. Business ownership, access to credit. Since they exist, since that poverty, sorry, exists in small amounts, so, sorry about that. Since the assets exist in small amounts in the poor households and, and gov poor households and the poor communities, government policy should aim to increase these assets. I think Microsoft may have confused my two versions of my report, but nonetheless, the essence is there. Let me go back up to see where I was, right? Governments, of, should, as I said, should aim to increase these assets. And of course, they use the budget as a tool to do things of this kind. So I want to come now to the question of needs. Um, there's a need for not only one survey, but three. Trinidad and Tobago has not been doing as is required a yearly survey of living conditions. And I think it's time. They have done one some time ago, but it's time to resume. I'm proposing that there are three surveys that need to be done. The yearly survey of living conditions designed to identify living conditions of households in poor communities. An annual ex-inmate survey designed to inform the evolving causes of youth crime and recidivism. A survey of income generating asset levels in poor households and communities conducted every three years. So you have those three surveys that I think need to be done in order to generate data uh, which can be used by the policy makers to take the relevant um, make the relevant interventions in the fortunes of people living in such communities. Public policy must be based on data collected and analyzed. We must have public policy that arises from a collaboration between the national government and the community that adheres to the principle that the community must govern and build itself. We are talking about reforming communities so that the residents of such communities can administer their, their own decisions um, to the reshaping of their lives. Continue with needs. The design of, a, an ad, of adequate public policy would require a governance system that integrates national and community governance structures. Funding by national government, CBOs and NGOs, medium and long-term agendas that incorporate yearly action plans. Some of the imperatives include research of the conditions in communities, particularly the psychological problems that accompany the economic and socio-economic conditions. It's not simply whether they have jobs or whether they have uh, good schools. It also has to do with the effects of such miserable conditions on their psyche, on their psychological balance. We must also have policy based on research. Now, some interventions are already indicated. We want, we want a definition of good schools, and we want those uh, households and those communities to have the same good schools that are available elsewhere in the community. There must be a right that these communities have to high-quality schooling, just as other communities have such schooling as a matter of course. So we want a state guarantee of good schools in these communities, right? What is available elsewhere must be available there too. We want no discrimination in that regard. We want properly trained and remunerated surrogate parents to fill the breach between home and school. And it's a large breach 
there's a breach also in some of the better off communities, but you could imagine the kind of gaps that exist between school and home in such communities. Another imperative is guaranteed yearly community funding. Economic restructuring projects that provide good employment and entrepreneurial opportunities for young people 18 to 24 years old. We also, I suggest, need to have a project to create a TechVoc TVET track parallel to the academic track, which has pervaded our educational system and consigned um, a lot, thousands of our students to futures that are demeaning, that are unproductive, that take them nowhere, and ignore, of course, certain uh, bends that um, students have, certain aptitudes, certain preferences, um, because, you know, not everybody can be academic, and academic knowledge is not the only kind of knowledge that a society uh, as diverse as all societies have. Uh, uh, from achieving um, their, their potential. I suggest as well that there should be pilot studies, particularly a pilot study that focuses on the community itself, ameliorating the, con the community itself, ameliorating the conditions of selected core poor families in selected disadvantaged communities. Well, will the government oblige in Budget 2021. Joe, Henry, Joe Remy has told us the government has not obliged, um, at least from 2014. Probably he could have gone back a little further and found that in, even in other budgets as well. And he is hoping that they will oblige this time around. I too am hoping that the government will oblige in 2021 in respect of the issues I've raised here and some of the proposals I have advanced. If it does not, it will be because, one, it continues to follow a model that privileges authoritarian top-down decision-making. Two, it conveniently comforts itself that COVID-19 has forced it to adopt and impose non-ameliorative measures. And three, it continues to make policy without the benefit of adequate data on the living conditions of poor and disadvantaged youth. Now, these reforms are particularly necessary in this time of COVID-19, uh, which drives, of course, economic disruption across the world, including Trinidad and Tobago, right? This, 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 the disruption, of course, has resulted so far in loss of import capacity as a result of falling oil and gas prices. I, I wasn't able to check the prices before coming on to this seminar this morning, but I'm sure the last time I checked, it was $45 for a barrel of oil, I think $1.68 for natural gas. So there is a loss of capacity that results in these kinds of prices. Slow down in tourist arrivals, you know the Caribbean is heavily dependent on tourism and related foreign exchange inflows, loss of value of the heritage and stabilization fund as foreign stock markets tumble and keep tumbling, aggravation of foreign exchange shortages. Unavailability of imports and related consequences such as slowdown in shipping which leads to supply shortages and rising prices, which themselves uh, lead to business closures and unemployment, especially in the distribution sector. Another result, loss of manufacturing export demand expressed in sharp declines in tourism arrivals by both air and sea in CARICOM's economies. Falling demand for TNT's exports of manufactured food and beverages, especially in the CARICOM market. Business closures and unemployment 
in this component of the manufacturing sector. Another result, local loss of productivity and economic recession. If there is local spread of COVID-19 overwhelming the health system or tight regimes for controlling the rate of infection, such as a limited movement and closure of workplaces, severe restriction, that's B, severe restrictions on movement between Tobago and Trinidad and school closures. So the critical question that arises at this point is how do we defeat the COVID-19 attack? And I ask questions rather than answer questions. I ask, by governance adjustments in which the executive is guided not only by its own discretions, but also by those of the opposition and civil society, by sustained reductions in the costs of credit, by rational moratoriums for businesses in the payment of taxes, including VAT, by undertaking critical investments to begin the process of diversifying the economy with a view to multiplying our competitive export streams, by increasing our agricultural productivity and the variety of food produced, adjusting our tastes in drink and food, reducing our purchase of foreign food and drink, Will we beat that attack by returning to the ways of reliance, of reliance on self and community and of sharing with community? Will we beat it by reducing our cost of living? And there are many more questions that one can ask. Those are the questions I think we have to consider if we want to defeat um, COVID-19 that seems to want to hang around forever one of the things we might want to do is to live with it and um <clears throat> and the the who perhaps should speed up the arrival of a vaccine because it appears that short of a vaccine we will continue to have community spread so these are my uh, suggestions as to what the government should be taking on board in relation to mitigating the suffering, the perennial uh, recurrence of misery in our poor and uh, disadvantaged communities, the consignment of thousands of our young people to uh, a life of aimlessness, lack of productivity, and ineluctably crime for some people who make that kind of choice. So if Mr. Imbert is listening, or if there are people in my audience who uh, are closer to his ears than I am, please let him know that these are the thoughts that have come from Winfield James this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. James. And when I listen to your presentation, I wondered whether we have the audience outside here listening to understand that there are people in their corner. People are speaking on their behalf. When we consider the hardship that our young people are faced to encounter every day and the ideas that you have brought to the table this morning talking about the concept of home gardening, the food support programs, the social issues to help our poor households, it cannot be further emphasized. It is overwhelmingly demanding that at this time, our leaders at the national level, our government, pay closer attention to what is happening with our young people so that they can come out of this very difficult period in their lives. When I listen to your presentation and your closing questions, it 
just have my mind running. Who really listens to all of these budget submissions that we as the people of Trinidad and Tobago and as organizations such as the League would have submitted in the past? And on what basis do they form their policies and not include the critical components of what you would have delivered for us this morning? I too trust that our Minister of Finance is listening, and if not him, his technical team, so that he can take back these ideas to the table. And it all adds up to one thing, more collaboration, including civil society, so that we can speak firsthand to the issues affecting our people. This morning, I am very pleased with the presentation, Dr. James, and I know we will have some questions for you later. Before I bring on our next speaker, I would like to say that we have registered with us and on the chat and YouTube, our guests from Anguilla, Dominica, Guyana, Jamaica, Grenada, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, St. Kitts and Nevis, and of course, our large audience from Trinidad and Tobago. We are in a very demanding environment and everyone wants to hear what we have to say. So I will now go straight into my next speaker and it is indeed a pleasure to have with us this morning, Mr. Cohen Valley, the CEO of KCL Capital Market Brokers and the Managing Director of Aspire Fund Management Company. This morning, he's going to speak with us on economic transformation, foreign and local investments. And Cohen, we are hoping that you can tell us how to get some investments to Trinidad and Tobago so that we can boost our economy. All to you, sir. Mr. Cohen Valley. Well, thank you very much, Diane and Colin. And good morning. I want to thank the Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago and Cipriani College for the inv in invitation this morning to, to share my thoughts with your audience. And hello to the regional audience. And like Dr. James, congratulations to Jamaica on its election results. Um, Diane just mentioned something, well, two things that I thought were very important. One, on co collaboration and I realize that um, similarly to the other speakers my conversation today is one about collaboration and that's not unique for the credit union movement because cooperatives are generally about just that the other thing that Diane mentioned was about bringing financial or foreign investors to our market. And I'm fully in support of that. But in many ways, my conversation today is about how we mobilize our investment base and we are the investors locally, regionally, and internationally. But I'll get into that. So. This morning, I'd like to share the views of KCL and Aspire and those of the financial sector consultants uh, with, which, with whom we chat with about these ideas. Um, I'll start with a brief economic outlook. I don't have any slides. Then we'll share our prognosis of the situation. Then we'll share our recommendations with respect to one of the uh, public policy paths that we think that the government should strongly consider at this time. If time permits, I'll share a case study in an effort to crystallize in your minds the benefits of the path that we see. So what's our economic outlook and what is the current state? Major economies across the globe are turning inward as a result of the pandemic. China and India have adopted a make local, buy local policy, with China likely to reduce its reliance on imports. 
focusing instead on internal demand to drive growth. The USA has adopted or seems to be adopting a Buy American policy. Australia has done the same and has signaled intentions to disengage with China. So what's our thought on that? Global trade is likely to decline, leading to continued downward pressure on energy prices and therefore continued downward impacts on our foreign exchange earnings. Global industries are shrinking at a rapid rate. In China, for example, over 2.3 million companies have closed with the closure expected to do, uh, um, have closed, and more closures are expected as a result of massing flooding there. Trinidad too faces the same trend of business closures and increased unemployment. To narrow the deficit, governments uh, at home and away will likely be forced to reduce headcounts. In Trinidad and Tobago, restricted FX, foreign exchange, devaluations, and a reduction in, subs in subsidies, as well as increased increases in the cost of utilities and in taxes are all on the horizon. Without appropriate intervention, these forces are expected to reduce demand for our goods and services. In this environment, broken international supply chains will need to be rerouted in favor of local and regional channels. So we have two questions given that prognosis. One, how does a small economy or how do small economies that are highly dependent on foreign change, trade, make the structural changes necessary to, su to survive and to thrive in this environment. And we have to look at that over the short, medium, and long term. So the second question, how much time do we have to make these structural changes? And we have to consider that under two states. One, that a vaccine will arrive in the short term, and two, that a vaccine arrives in the medium to long term or some other unforeseen and material threat to our national security presents itself, be it uh, risk to our health, economic risk, social risks, environmental risks, or military risks. So what's our th what are our thoughts on it? One, if a vaccine is on the horizon eminently, then COVID is a wake up call and we need to start today to make the structural changes to our economy that are necessary to improve our nation, our national and regional economic and social security. Two, if a vaccine is not on the immediate horizon, or if we are to endure another major shock to our economic, social, or health security, we need to start making the structural changes to our economy yesterday. Either way, in either option, we have to do the same things. Even before COVID-19, our economy was hurting here in Trinidad and Tobago from the fall in global energy prices. That decline coupled with entity specific structural issues led to the closure of Petrotrin and severance packages at TSTT, two of our largest employers. Those decisions, as many of you know and have felt directly impacted league members, league families, some of whom are undoubtedly in the office, in the audience today. So what are the lessons 
The time is now to diversify our income streams. When we think about what has happened, we recognize, or at KCL and Aspire we do, that an over-reliance on a single income stream uh, exposes our nation's families to severe instability and insta imbalances. Multiple income streams restore st uh, stability and balance. So that's one of our takeaways. And I like to think of it as a three-legged st stool. When you're thinking about income streams, you have active income, and that's what we all enjoy from employment, from exchanging our labor for monetary rewards. That's one leg of a stool. But if our stool only had that single leg, stools can balance on one, but it, stools are often better with more. So then there's passive income. And that, for example, could be from rental, renting property or for gains in real estate like your one's home. The third leg of the stool is portfolio income. And that comes from dividends, interest, and capital gains. And these are the, this is, that's the one I wanna focus on. While the first two are finite, we can only work so much and so long. Our work life, we retire from 55 um, to 65. Some, if we're lucky, retire earlier. Some who want to, to continue working, retire later. But it's finite. So is passive income from rent or home ownership. There's only so much property that any country can absorb. However, portfolio income is infinite. So I want to explore this. In addition, as Diane had said, to encouraging foreign companies to invest here. Why don't we, or let us, collaboratively, collectively, invest our capital both here and there? Mr. Remy spoke about tripartite agreements or multipartite agreements, and I fully agree. The collaboration there is through public and private partnerships. We can collectively build an investment portfolio that works in a COVID and in non-COVID environments. And more importantly, we don't have to leave our home to do that in the path that we are recommending. When we actively invest here and there, we are seeking out businesses, businesses in our country, businesses in our region, many of those on the call today, business in your country, in your island states, and international business where we can put our money to work. So in a COVID, in a non-COVID environment, global innovation abounds. Innovation is always in search of capital. I read an article in one of the newspapers this morning that said the Notting Hill Carnival delivered a successful virtual carnival viewed by over 300,000 participants. Somehow we find a way to not only survive, but to thrive. So global innovation, just like this conference, this discussion this morning, continues. And we need to invest in that innovation. So what is the call to action in our view? Let's establish 
a Trinidad and Tobago, or if some in the region agree with me, a regional private and public investment fund that invests in private and public equity of the most promising next generational local, regional, and international companies. Dr. James spoke about generational, multi-generational poverty. What I'm speaking about here is the potential for multi-generational wealth. In TNT and in our region, the Caribbean region, we would be investing in businesses, seeking out those businesses that promote and support national food security, of course, employment, national health security, supply chain security, and education security, among other sectors. And then we would look globally for businesses that we consider to be next generation. So here's our policy recommendation to that effect. The first policy action does not require any capital on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. It requires a stroke of a pen. What we are suggesting is that the government instruct the inspector of financial institutions to enable a special provision in the pension and the insurance acts allowing our largest wealth management entities, insurance companies, pension firms, asset managers, to invest in private equity. Now, we've seen that in the government's manifesto just prior to the last election, that they've signaled a commitment to this path. We are saying to enable that commitment, that step could make all the difference because we have investment capital. And this includes the credit unions as a private sector partner, back to that collaborative concept. We together invest to find the best and the brightest opportunities. In this audience across the region, there are people that any of you, probably each of you know, that have wonderful business ideas. But as Dr. James says, some of them don't have access to capital. We can help change that by actively investing our capital. So the second policy recommendation is to invest, um, for the government to invest in this partnership fund the government of Trinidad and Tobago because our budget is coming up. But since we have a regional audience, governments across the region to invest in this fund, perhaps to a maximum, as an example, of 1% of the value of Trinidad and Tobago's Heritage and Stabilization Fund. That 1% is probably less than 300 million TT dollars or less, that's less than 1%, it's probably three quarters of 1%. Or the US dollar equivalent of that, which is probably about 45 million US dollars. But not investing alone. The private sector matches or exceeds that amount. With no private sector partner investing more than 1% of their available investable capital. And we also partner with academia. So those are our policy recommendations. And they're not new in terms of uh, testing this strategy across the world. It's been done by the Dutch state, the FMO in, 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 in um, the Netherlands, it's been done in India. It's being done 
as our Jamaican colleagues know, who are on the line now, in Jamaica, there is precedent. And we see the changes, and I suspect that it's part of what contributed to this landslide slide win for the Labour Party in Jamaica. So we're... I go in. Just um, check your microphone, please. Oh, it just clicked. Yes. Uh, my apologies. I was asking Diane if I had a few minutes left. If I did, I will go into the case study. If not, I will thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cohen. Um, I think time would be against us for the, for the case study. Um, but I, I know maybe you would have um, the opportunity under the, the question and answer segment to get in some additional points. Cohen, Thank you um, so much. we have Mr. Bot Bartholomew who is waiting to actually speak to your presentation. Yes, thank you so much. And it was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. And I mean, so many topics to speak on. And in particular, um, you touched on the next gen or the next generation investment, which could probably come from local, regional, and international investors, as well as I was particularly intrigued by your, your focus on the modification of traditional platforms, particularly as it pertains to moving the entire credit union movement and sector forward. I think it's instructive also the policy actions that you touched on, um, those ranging from the stroke of a pen by the government to the actual active investment by private companies as well as by academia. And I, I believe, you know, it, it shifts the discussion in a particular direction to of policy diversity, portfolio diversification, sorry, which you also spoke on. And that portfolio income really positioning the movement and individuals and communities in a stronger, sustainable position for the future. So, and that's being done collaboratively and collectively, I think, it's very critical that you have touched on that. And I know when the question and answer segment arises, there will be a lot for you to contribute to that, even as you have stated there, your case study. So thank you very much for that, Mr. Cohen Valley. So I turn you over to Ms. Joseph, who will bring on our next presenter. Thank you very much, Colin. And this morning, the, the, the session is um, going beyond our expectation. And our audience uh, is really focused heavily on the presentations from our speakers. And the feedback is that they are really very impressed with what they are hearing so far. And I believe that having heard all that we would have heard over the last hour. It is my pleasure now to bring on the lady of the moment who had the experience of sitting in that chair at the Ministry of Finance a couple of years ago. And we at the League are happy to have her here with us this morning. And I must say, it, give credit to whom credit is due. When she held the chair of Finance Minister, there wasn't any events in terms of the launch of our calendar of events and so forth that we would have asked her to speak at, to deliver the feature address, to launch our calendars of events and so forth, which she would have declined. And for that, we continue to remember this honorable lady, Miss Karen Tishero, who is gonna speak with us this morning on the topic 
the Trinidad and Tobago economy. Where are we? And how do we move forward? We are anxious to hear. Let's welcome Ms. Karen Tishera. Are you seeing me? I'm seeing you. I'm hearing you as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning, everyone, to the Credit Union Legal Course. Um, thank you for inviting me, and of course, to Planning Legal College and all your several listeners to the region. Um, my talk is a pretty straightforward one. It's the future. Um, in the context of the upcoming budget, and of course, what the budget really speaks to is what government is, in a sense, in arithmetic and mathematical terms for the future, at least for the next year, in a COVID environment. But I think it's important to start by saying that we talk about recovery from COVID, and I think it's important that we understand that prior to March. When we had our first case, so we started earlier than that. It was Trinidad and Tobago constraint. We really felt the impact of the COVID and having to make uh, decisions. Um, our economy was in very serious, uh, a serious situation, and to put it mildly, I'll just give you some idea of what we were then. We were running persistent fiscal deficit from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. Of course, we understand that 2020 is going to be front because of COVID. These are going to fell in 2014 from 88 to present our position, 105 in the ease of doing business in 2019. There's 18 quarters of negative growth, and that is coming from the Central Bank. The Central Bank also published that 17% of our households were experiencing indebtedness. And that was greater, uh, just above what we call non investor what we call junk status. And so our foreign exchange reserve, which is an important factor, we saw our foreign exchange reserves fall from 11.5 billion in 2014. Too well, if I have to rely on the January figure to 6.8 billion. So that was in fact what we're looking at to be even before the, the COVID. And of course, we all know that the point in Lisa's industrial estate, we experienced seven. Have you lost me? Have you lost me? Are you? I'm hearing you. Are you? Oh, I saw your network connection. Yes, and then you saw. So you're hearing me and seeing me. I'm hearing and seeing a little bit um, of a challenge in between. Okay. And on top of which, we saw the closure of about seven plants in the Point Lisa's Industrial Estate. Yes, part of it was because of global demand, definitely being. Uh, reduced, but even before 2019, before the COVID-19 and uh, pandemic, even before that, we saw demand redu reducing, and all of the companies. Yes. There was a small technical problem, and um, I, I hand over to you, Colin, to um, keep us updated on the progress with our technical issue. Yes. All right. So when the issue is rectified, I will intervene again. In the meantime, I know you could engage and she oh, okay. is back. Yes, Mr. Shara. I'm back? Yes, you are. Okay, so I sort of gave an overview of what the state of the economy was pre-COVID 
And I showed you in many areas that we were in serious difficulties, whether it was in the point in Lisa's industrial estate with the closure of a number of companies, whether it was regard to running fiscal deficit, whether it was regard to um, 18 and a quarter economic decline in terms of our GDP. In all those areas, the country was in difficulty. But what was even more concerning, I think, from my point of view, was implementation. The implementation, all of this before COVID. Um, the National Statistical Institute, um, I heard Mr. Winford James talk about looking at the 2020 budget, but I went right back to 2016 and I looked at each of the budgets. And in nearly every budget, we were told that we were getting the statistical, uh, National Statistical Institute. Why is it so important? Because you can't really manage what you cannot measure. You cannot really plan and do any serious planning with the lack of data. And the IMF, the rating agencies have all spoken about that issue. To date, there's no National Statistical Institute. We talk about the procurement legislation, two key parts of that procurement legislation, section seven and 24. To date, I do not recall know the reason why that has not been enacted. The newspapers have done editorials on it. And while you might say, what's in two sections? Those are the two sections that require government to report any um, contract that they have for the private sector or government to government, and for the regulator to report those um, contracts to the national community by the parliament. Um, as a result of that, we know that the whole issue with the Chinese building of $470 million worth of houses in South Trinidad, the terms were so egregious and were not subject to any oversight, no tendering procedure. And it was because, of course, no Section 724 in order to avoid something like that. In the Trinidad Revenue Authority, well, even in my time, that was something on the table. Um, yet it has not come to pass. We also see that the two game changers, the major game changers, the Dragon Field. Since 2017, I think um, Dr. Terence Farrell, when he did an article on a point of inflection, said that the idea of us getting gas, a gas pipeline uh, from the Dragon Field built by Shell was, not, was too remote because the the government, that is the Trump government, would not allow that um, to, to, to come to being. And in fact, in 2017, that dragon field, gas field, was a very important to provide natural gas, a feedstock to the, not only to the petrochemical industry, Ponegrisas, but also to the other plants that were coming on board in La Brea, the UME plant, with Mitsubishi being a major investor. That has not come to pass. Then we had the big game changer standards where we know what has happened to that. Uh, property tax, so perhaps that's a good thing that hasn't happened. And then we have the Economic Advisory Board, which is, I guess, supposed to be a sort of a think tank uh, within a year and a half, two years that was um, disbanded. So, and, and the Gambling Commission. Well, personally, I, I do not support a Gambling Commission at all, because I think a major issue in our country is corruption. And I think that a uh, commission may not be the way to go. I think that um, gambling is definitely part of our organized crime structure in this country. And even the Minister of um, Finance, and I think his first or second budget speech, said that Trinidad and Tobago has the largest, the greatest number of uh, private member clubs, i.e. casinos, in the entire world and there has been an even greater proliferation of that so when you look at all that i have said um, you know in terms of the government's implementation in the terms of the government's um, position in terms of the rating agencies where we are just above a junk bond or a non-investment when you see the ptt coming out after the minister said that there would be an increase in production of gas and coming out and having to say soon after that was not the case, 
when you see the IMF contradicting the minister when he talks about our growth in terms of our um, GDP, when you see those things happening, it does not do much to inspire confidence in the government, not only in terms of uh, what is said to you, but also in fact its implementation plan. It really makes you question um, if they didn't do it in four and a half years, if they didn't listen to the Economic Advisory Board, if they didn't do all of those things in four and a half years, what is this the, under these very um, serious stringent circumstances that they are going to be able to do it? Um, when we talk about the budget specifically, where is the money coming from? Well, they passed an amendment to the Heritage and Civilization Fund, uh, I think it's Section 58, which allows them to draw down $1.5 billion out of a fund at any point in time in the year. So I anticipate that when we're looking at um, funding for the deficit, and every year we run a deficit, deficit and every year, um, based on my research, it was always understood by the minister, and significantly so. This time, um, definitely it will not be understated because of COVID. So where's the money to come from? It's gonna come from the HSF, I am sure. Um, and by the way, on the HSF, I heard a previous speaker talk about um, the situation in, 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 in the United States. In fact, in spite of the unemployment rate being now 8.4% uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the economy supposedly a lot of uh, people out of work, the reality is the stock exchange is doing extraordinarily well. And this is why our HSF is doing very well, because our HSF is really invested in US stocks and stocks and shares. And the main reason for that is because people believe that the real reason that the economy is in this difficulty is because of COVID. And they anticipate that in a few years with the vaccine and so on, that their stock and shares will recover. You're seeing that in housing, they're saying the housing prices have gone up, people are moving into the suburbs. They're saying car prices are also increasing. Or, and that again is because people are moving into the suburbs and then they're saying also all the technology and internet um, stocks and shares are doing extraordinarily well. The fact I think that race United States, I suspect, and Trinidad and Tobago is that they are not, they are really going to lock. They had a very strong economy. Whether you like Mr. Trump or don't like Mr. Trump, the reality was that the unemployment rate was very low, stocks and shares were doing extremely well, and the economy was doing extremely well. And then came COVID. One could say he mismanaged and is mismanaging COVID, but at the end of the day, the vaccine, when it does come, people believe that the economy is going to recover. That we cannot say for Trinidad. So what do we do moving forward? Because at the end of the day, looking at some sort of a plan to take Trinidad and Tobago forward. I think that the contribution that Mr. Bali made is an excellent one because it allows you to make an investment um, you, without having to rely on actual um, um, persons being in the country, let it in the country, um, and allows you to take advantage of the internet and the, the, the movement going forward and in, in, in investment in stocks and, and shares. I think that what we uh, are looking at, food, I think we've all talked about food security. I think in order to have food security, we are going to have to look at revaluing our TT dollar because one of the difficulties that Jamaica and that Venezuela had when oil prices collapsed is that their food import bill was so huge, only said to be 8%. And the reason for that was that the Bolivar was overvalued, so there was no incentive to the local farmers to grow, so they imported most of their food. I think we have to look at revaluation of our US dollar. We have to look at definitely looking at food security, but we also have to look at production of high-end, high-value products, and whether it is in chocolate, 
whether it is in cocoa, whether it is in coffee, whether it is in turkey, I think there are great opportunities for us to produce, just as how we talk about um, the, the Swiss chocolate, they produce no cocoa, and Belgian chocolate, we need to get into the high-end production in, um, in food. We also need to have a steel pan production. We need to have a readying for cultural tourism because I know that the government now has merged tourism with culture because I think that is our advantage and our strong. And of course, I think we need to reduce the licenses of persons bringing in these fast foods. Those fast food licenses just eat up our foreign exchange and create only low value jobs. I think that is the future food security. We have to look at revaluing our currency. We have to look at production of high-end, high-value products in our agriculture. We have to look at a steel pan production in a very serious way. We have to ready ourselves for cultural tourism. We have to look at reduction of the licenses to these fast food um, that are in the country and reduce that. And we have to start looking seriously at the IFC. And finally, finally on that issue is, I don't think we can move forward until we get serious about um, re renegotiating the gas price. Perhaps we need to get gas from Ghana. If the gas price that was negotiated with the upstream industry cannot be re renegotiated, maybe we need to look at Ghana as a source of natural gas, as a feedstock. And finally, We've got to look at the issue of reduction of rent. We are paying rent. And one thing we have learned now is that we can work remotely at home. And that is going to be a significant savings in terms of the rents that we pay in Port of Spain, household savings, use of gas, wear and tear on our roads, uh, usage of water, usage of electricity. There are so many ways that we can uh, benefit from the rental price the properties we need to reduce that we need also to look seriously seriously at the issue of crime and people say well why you know what's the big what is, is the big deal about that if you look at our budget every year i think this year was the first time number one item on our budget is that national security ten billion dollars on average and we Put for crime. And when we look at countries like Barbados, where national security budget comes at about fifth or sixth on the uh, line of expenditure, we understand that that is money that could go into education, that could go into health, that could go into macro projects. And so, my suggestion with regard to the issue of crime is to stop looking at the symptoms and effects of crime in the so called disadvantaged communities are looking at the cause. We need to increase staff in GPP. GPP has said they are 57% understaffed. We need to look at proper um, patrolling of our waters. Um, that seems to be a big uh, issue. We need to look at whether we want to have casinos at all because that is part of the organized crime. So if we are going to really deal with the crime in a serious way, um, we need to look at all those issues, um, DPP, patrolling of our workers, the casinos, those are some of the things that we need to look at in terms of dealing seriously with the crime. So that is my um, projection for the moving forward um, in terms of where the opportunities the government has moving forward. So I think I use my 20 minutes. Come on here, Ms. Joseph. Sorry? I said I, I, I'm saying I think I used up my use my 20 minutes to keep to the time frame that I was allotted. It was of putting forward the position as before COVID. Um, oh, and I do think that one of the things we've got to do now is in a very careful way, start reopening up the 
economy because we simply can't, the government cannot afford to give the kind of support or financial support, economic support for companies. So we've got to do it carefully, uh, maintain the protocols that have been put in place, using the self-quarantining, but we're going to have to slowly but carefully reopen the economy. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Tishera, for your presentation this morning, and uh, very insightful indeed. And some of the things that um, stood out to us, um, and, and we are hearing about it in all other sectors outside there, is the issue of the procurement legislation. We are also hearing concern about the HSF and what's happening with that and the implications for um, it's dwindling. And I like your last comment there with regard to the crime situation and the casino and the perception that some of the crimes that are being happening here in Trinidad and Tobago and around um, other countries as well are linked in, in some way to um, casino operations. And these are some of the things that we need to look at. And um, there is no doubt about it because under the AML and CFT laws, the casinos are also there and considered a, a high risk um, operation. So these are some of the things that we need to um, pay close attention to. And also I like your closing there where we believe that where you stated that our government should consider reopening the economy because um, that's our view as well. Once we follow all the protocols that are required for COVID-19, we really believe that the economy should be open gradually and more and more rather than rolling back because it is affecting our operations. I can say for credit unions, we have submitted our approvals and we got all our protocols approved but yet, because of the restrictions on the numbers and all of those things, we cannot host our annual general meetings. And um, for sure, we know that if we continue to keep our economy as tight as it is, we will have some challenges going forward to survive. So thank you so much. And we will get into the question and answer segment. But I, I know um, Colin is standing by, but we have a couple of our um, participants asking about the case study from Mr. Valley, and I understand that it can be in the vicinity of five minutes, and if that can happen, Colin, I, I pass it to you. <laughs> yes, yes, most definitely, and I, I believe we're getting into the most exciting, you know, the, the, this is really the climax of the occasion. I think persons really, you know, want to, to put these presenters at test. <laughs> so we have some we have some questions coming through in the chat. And first of all, I'd like to engage Mr. Remy. And uh, Mr. Remy, you spoke to a number of of perspectives. We're talking policy perspectives, we're talking fiscal measures, we're talking legislative perspectives. But one you spoke to was regarding the technical assistance fund and tying that into the employment relationship. Now, as a movement that as we are in this pre-budget workshop, we're looking at this technical assistance fund. Now, um, COVID in his contribution alluded to public-private partnerships as well as Dr. James in order to move it forward. How do you envision this technical assistance fund and for the purposes of this pre-budget workshop, how, how would you position it in terms of the government's agenda for strengthening not only the credit union sector, but bringing about economic and social empowerment for the people of Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, Colin, and, and that's a, um, Colin, that's a very interesting question. And, and we have you, have, you have different iterations of how you want to do it. But in the initial stages, I am of the belief that there could be a collaboration between some funding from the government, some liquidity, liquidity support from the credit union movement. And, and then we use the, the concept that Ku and them came up with in terms of that investment opportunity so that the fund could have an opportunity to grow. Because what you don't want is to have a static fund and just stay with pumping money all the time. 
You want to give the fund the opportunity to grow, just as how we have the HSF for the national economy. We believe in the in the issue of development of the cooperative sector and that partnership we want to grow, and that trust for that investment into private and public equity, that we should have that collaboration between the government, the business, that's why I said the tripartite from government, business, and cooperatives, build that fund, and then engage in some good investment opportunities so that the fund itself could be um, sustained over a period of time, and it will bring a level of viability and give some value to the purpose of having the fund. Because what you want at the end of the day is to have persons benefiting from the opportunities that the fund could accrue to them and by engaging them in some developmental opportunities and bringing them back into the labor market. Because what we don't want, the more unemployment you have, the problem you're going to have with crime and all the other attendant social ills. And I think the we could start by using that tripartite mechanism, government, business, credit union, fund the fund, and then investment going forward. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And this dovetails into a question for Dr. James. In terms of your presentation and what you placed on the platter for, for the young people in terms of moving them forward, it's interesting because cooperatives and credit unions have now been placed on the schedule of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. So given now that there is a, a ministerial shift and a, an, an alignment now with youth development and national service, how is it that uh, in terms of the title of your presentation, the disadvantaged youth, and then the offerings that you made in terms of the measures that could be adopted by the government, how can you, or how would you recommend the government formulate this under this new ministerial agenda and portfolio? Thank you, Colin. And the simple answer is pass pass my presentation on to the new minister. <laughs> it's all there. I don't know what the foci of the new minister is going to be. I know it's the same government, but I don't know what the new minister's ideas are. But the ideas that I have presented in the presentation speak to the question of disadvantaged youth. Thousands of young people who are shut out from online education, for example, because they simply don't have the devices. Mm -hmm. They don't have the connectivity. They have to borrow neighbor's um, Wi-Fi, for example, yeah. some of them. And some houses are not electrified. And this is across the country. And this is in 2021. This is after oil boom, after oil boom in this country. Hmm. So we have thousands of lower class kids, and they have a certain coloration as well, by the way, who are doomed to lives of aimlessness, lack of access to capital and credit, right? And it doesn't have to be that way if government focuses on these people and their communities. I am not talking about an open kind of uh, attention to the problem across the country. I'm talking about the identification of disadvantaged communities, right? Doing the relevant research to know what the problems are and therefore what solutions can be had. I'm talking about that so that the mm -hmm. shift from one ministry to the other um, to my mind, does not signal any special opportunity um, for these people. So, but there is a, a lobbying work to be done. The, the credit union can get involved in this lobbying work, lobbying on behalf of these communities. The labor college can get involved in that now, in that also, yeah. because of the focus of its programs, right? But what is sure is that we cannot continue to accommodate conditions that prolong multi-generational poverty. We cannot encourage or be silent on um, the lack of attention to the problems 
that SEA students have right now, or not SEA, elementary students have in, in accessing education in, a, in the time of COVID. I mean, this is it's almost criminal. And, and the, the government is reduced to asking private sector to help out. It's almost as if the problem is now arising, but I want to suggest to you that the problems of um, those communities predate the arrival of COVID. What COVID, COVID has been doing is to exacerbate that situation, but COVID did not create it. COVID, is go of course, is going to uh, <clears throat> create situations of insufficiency where before there was plenty. COVID is going to cause us to reduce, cause us to reduce um, expenditure on certain items. But what really shouldn't happen is, is the disadvantage, the educational disadvantage to kids, to people under 24, to teenagers, to people coming, getting into uh, adolescence, right? And having um, reduced fortunes, you know, simply because the adults did not properly prepare for them. And that's why I talked about the surrogate parenthood, you know, that um, <clears throat> there are some homes that simply cannot hold down a job and at the same time see about their kids. Yes, it is just impossible to do. And, you know, people have to, people have to select, they have to choose. But if you choose to see about the kids, supervise, you can't get a job. If you get the job, you can't see about the children. You have to rely on granny and other people. I am just saying it is wrong for perennially there to be children who cannot access the foundations of education just like other kids elsewhere in the country. But the change of minister, the change of ministry, I, I am not at this moment sure how that could redound, apart from the fact that there will be a focus on you. But I don't know yet, uh, by any of the pronouncements I've heard so far, how that would automatically redound to the benefit of our children and our, our, our older, older uh, youth. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, good to know I still fall in the category of older youth. But um, ah. I will, <laughs> I will. Yeah. Ms. Joseph, I, I, I know you had um, some a question for Ms. Tishara. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a question here um, with regard to the issue of procurement. And this is according to our um, participants, is a long-standing issue. And they would like to hear from you some of the implications of continuing to have the procurement legislation on store. Ms. Tishira. Press yes, the Ms. mic. Yeah, Put the mic on. Yes. You hearing me now? Yes, yes. yeah. The most um, recent greatest example, I would say, of the effect of the failure to pass two particular sections, section 7 and section 24 of the procurement legislation. Most of the legislation has been passed, but those key provisions have not. What do those two key provisions require? They require that any government to government or government to private sector contract must be reported to the office of the regulator, procurement regulator. Secondly, he has, so he has all that. And then secondly, after he has to then report that contract to the parliament to ensure that there is transparency. Now, what is the effect of not passing those two pieces of um, two sections? We saw it most recently with the so-called building of 5,000 houses by a Chinese company that had been blacklisted by World Bank. According to what our understanding is, 
the then Minister of Housing had to have been uh, the Prime Minister, because at that point in time, I believe early in that year, he moved the then Minister of Tourism, um, Randall, to Minister of Tourism, and he took over the Ministry of Housing. He held that ministerial position from, I think, January to, I think, August. During that period, I believe it's all it's a matter of public record, so you can check it yourself. Um, I think in June of that year, they entered into a memorandum of agreement, and that memorandum of agreement set out the basic terms and condition, which were very much not in our interest in terms of the repayment schedule to be paid in US dollars, in a number of things are not in our interest. I can't remember who it is that um, exposed it. I know Rad Murad is one of the people that spoke on it. And suddenly, heard, oh, it was a mistake, oh, it should not have happened, and there was a backtracking. And that, the editorial and express editorials spoke so it's not just what I am saying. And that is a clear example of the need to pass Section 724, because if Section 724 had been passed, if that never happened, it would have had to go through a tender process. It would have been on the oversight of the Office of the Regulator, and the contract would have had to be called to the Parliament of Trinidad Tobago. So do not underestimate the importance of, and why the government to date, to date, has failed to pass those two key sections, especially when we have seen the impact of it, remains a mystery to me. Thank but you very I, much. And I, I think um, anyone um, looking at more than the governance standards would recognize the importance of passing this piece of legislation because it does speak to the issue of accountability and um, we agree with you that it is very important and corruption, and corruption because that memorandum of agreement was signed i think it's in the public records it was signed either in june or july and then the prime minister relinquished the ministry of housing and gave an, an, an religious ministry in mid August, but the memorandum of understanding was signed when the prime minister held the post of minister of housing, a post that he held from January to July, when he moved with then Randall Mitchell, who was the minister of housing, and moved him to tourism for that period of time. So when you see something like that happen, and then the explanation that was given is that that is something for the chairman or the CEO, who I think was Newman George. But when you look at the legislation, I do not think that the uh, the the chairman or whatever he was could make that decision without the input of the minister, the then minister. So eventually, that memorandum of understanding was then converted into an agreement, which I think was signed a year later at Hyatt. But that is a very, 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 very clear example of why that section 724 should have been passed. And the question is why to date it has not been passed. And I think we all we all will pick on the answer to that very question. Well, now um Chloe is standing yes. by. We have our presenters asking for the case study. Um for the Chloe. Case study. Yes. And if we can have it in short form, uh, we will be happy to present. So all to yes. you, Cohen. Well, thank you again. Five minutes or less. So I'm going to just ask you guys to, to imagine that we have set up this collaborative fund to look for public and private and principally private equity opportunities across the globe. So it could be local regional or international. And I'm gonna go back in time to give you this example, but all throughout, I'm gonna ask you to consider when you might invest, okay? If at all, we as this collective. So in 1886, there was this Atlanta-based pharmacist 
His name is John. John came up with this elixir. And he come to us, if we were present then, and said, this elixir does all sorts of things. It cures all kinds of diseases, right? And it also tastes great. He put his money in, and let's say John asked us to participate. Question one, would you likely to participate with John and his elixir? Because there are many Johns around the world, and they have their equivalent of an elixir. Well, in the first year, John was selling his elixir for something like five cents per unit. And he was selling about nine units a day. So over the first year, five cents at that time is about 13, and that's five US cents, is about $13 in, in, in current day money. So in the first year, at that rate, he sold about $165 worth of elixir. So if we had come and looked at his business and said, boy, for the first year, you've only done $165 um, dollars worth of business. That's something like 4,500 US dollars today. Would we have invested then this fund that we've erected? Okay. So another year, uh, another year goes by and um, a businessman approaches John. His name is Asa, and he says, John, see your track record. I'll buy your formula from you for $2,300 US dollars in 1887 money. That's about 63,000 US dollars today. Would we have been Asa looking at the track record? In 1899, Asa sells the rights to bottle the formula for $1. In 1919, Asa and his family sell the company for a combination of cash and shares for 25 million US dollars. So in 1887, put in 2,300 US dollars. In 1919, he sold it for 25 million. I think you would agree that's not a bad return. So he sold it to a gentleman by the name of Ernest. Later that same year, after investing $25 million, and I still ask you, would our fund have seen that track record for this elixir? And of course, knowing more information than I'm sharing with you now, would we likely invest at that point? 25 million at that time is equivalent to about $680 million today, US dollars. That's what ASA uh, purchased it for. So of course, uh, ASA, uh, uh, um, Ernest purchased it for, excuse me, ASA and his family uh, are happy. They made $25 million and they have a continuing interest. But later on that year, Ernest listed that company on a public exchange, probably the New York Stock Exchange. He sold each share at $40 US per share. If you had invested, and put it this way, if your family had purchased one share of that company in 1990 when he listed it, today, because of stock splits, that share would be worth 300,000 US, that single share. If you had in reinvested all the dividends the shares has, had paid over that time, that single share is worth 10 million US dollars in 2012 money. Okay. Would we have invested? You may all recognize by now the company, and of course, this is a great success story. It's Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, well, we have Coca-Cola bottling plant here in Trinidad. Coca-Cola, when I was saying that, remember, John was selling nine units a day. Now, Coca sells, estimates it sells over a billion 
units a day. John's no longer here. Asa's not here. Ernest is not here. But the wealth that they created is. Coca-Cola is still here. And by the way, Coca-Cola is still, in my opinion, a very good investment. There are Johns all throughout our region. There are Johns in every corner of the communities in Trinidad and Tobago. We need to find out how to let Johns, the Johns of the world, know that we have a fund that's interested in investing in them. We may not invest in the startup. We may wait. And some of them may fail. But you only need one to be successful or two to build that generational wealth. So that's the case study in a very condensed form. Hopefully I'm under five minutes. Thank no, you. definitely. And I mean, th this was this was some billion dollar worth in case study here. And you know, it's it leads me to, to a question which is really prefaced on some comments that we have. And one of my colleagues um, made a contribution that, you know, this our country requires systems that changes the emphasis and reduces the emphasis on the state centralization and places emphasis on entrepreneurship and on entrepreneurship. And then I see my my good friend Chris Marcus also making a, a, a comment that we have at this time a huge opportunity for private and public sector to strengthen the balance sheets of SMEs going forward. Now it's very instructive in that case study that you had a micro business that grew that that grew sorry into a worldwide phenomena and impacting the global economy so to the question Cohen, we always speaking about the collaborative and the collective capacity of the credit union movement and here we have it locally as well as we have regional participants. The challenge faced in that collaboration with regard to investment is that you usually find a less than savvy investment portfolio and focus in the credit union movement. Now that we have given we have been given this opportunity to discuss this before the budget, how do you how do you recommend or what would be your recommendations to, to improve the investment savviness, quote unquote, of the credit union movement, particularly collaboratively, collectively, and in partnership, public, private? Government. Thank you, Colin. I, I think you you answered the question. It's it's really in that word collaboration and locking arms with the private sector, who specialize in looking for, as Mr. Remy had said in his presentation, and you commented on that low hanging fruit. Looking globally for that low hanging fruit, looking locally. There are so many great ideas, and we get to see them all the time, that we can invest in, in Trinidad and Tobago, through Latin America and the broader Caribbean, and into North America. When we own, when we own parts of those companies, they're not public today. They're not household names today. But in three to five years, they might be, or maybe longer. When we own parts of those companies together, those income streams flow back to our shores. COVID, I wouldn't say uh, COVID proof, but our capital can travel where we can't. 
We don't have to e erect um, um, companies away and companies that are away don't have to come to our shores. We can invest in that low hanging fruit after deep due diligence, which would be supported by people who do that for their day job so everyone else can continue in their day jobs. But we take the, the thumbs up as a collective or the thumbs down. Hope that answers at least part of your question. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. I, I think I think you did answer um, answer yes. Colin very well. Thank you so much. And we're seeking to get into our presenter closing comments. And I would invite my president, Mr. Joseph Remy, to make his closing comment. Each presenter, two to three minutes to have your closing comments. Please, Mr. Remy. Hi, thanks much, Diane. And and first let me once again on behalf of the Board of Directors and the wider credit union membership. Thanks, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies for this opportunity. And I did in signal to Colin, this is going to be the beginning of a very hectic journey together. And we're using this word collaboratively as you move forward in terms of dispensing development and educational opportunities to the wider national community. We at the League are very mindful of the challenges that we are faced with now with respect to COVID-19 and as such the partnership with Cipriani needs to be emboldened, needs to be enhanced and needs to be rolled forward in a manner that is going to be of mutual benefit to both of us and we look forward to working closely with you guys in terms of that. I also want to thank Dr. James and uh, Ms. Tishera for their insightful presentation. Kerwin as usual has brought to bear a different dispensation in terms of how we deal with finance and how we deal with investments to the table. And I think it's, it's something new and it's something innovative. The League has joined with, with KCL and Aspire, and we are working closely to see how we could change the dispensation in terms of how we see things. What I would really like to see, and Dr. James raised a very important point, and you, Colin, made mention that you are aware that the credit union, the cooperative sector, is going to be reporting to the Ministry of Youth and um, national service and and preliminarily i am seeing a misalignment while we don't want to condemn the youth we are very much for youth development we are very much for having the cooperative principles return to the agenda i could also always recall being a junior cooperative member when i was in in primary school so yes we would like to see the cooperative development return to that structure but we want to signal to the government that we need to have a discussion in terms of where we believe is the best fit for the cooperative sector, particularly the credit union sector, based on the amount of work that we would have done in advancing the cause of credit union development and the role that we would play in national development. And I'm signaling that we are going to advocate strongly to have that discussion so we could have a dedicated ministry, if not one single ministry, but a focus on cooperative. And we can't be just another attachment hanging on like if we we don't have a, a place of um, a board. I feel that that could signal some level of disrespect, which we are not comfortable with as a movement. And as such, we are going to forcefully advocate for the movement to have that say. Thank you very much. That's my closing remarks. Thank you, Mr. Remy. And I know that you had a good morning. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your presentation and your closing comments. I would like to invite Dr. Winford James, our political analyst, to bring his closing comments. Dr. James. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Diane, do you know that before I became a political analyst, I was a teacher? I have been a teacher most of my life, my all of my adult life. That's years and years and years. But apparently nobody knows this, which is sad. Well, anyhow, thanks for the opportunity. And I want to emphasize the fact that too many young people, and we can age them from 24 downwards to 18, adults, or even below that. We have students, of course, at the um, elementary level and at the secondary level who are falling into deep 
creators that have been created by government policy neglect across generations. And they don't seem to have the political voice to speak up on their own behalf and to cause a transformation in their fortunes. They desperately need somebody to speak up on their behalf. Because one of the consequences of their being mired in the poverty and misery that we know that they are in is crime. And it's crime for economic opportunity. Because the economic opportunity has not uh, been something that policy has focused on so that their lives can be restored and can take another uh, direction and their children now would not continue in the misery that they and their forebears had to experience. The way to do that is to get information. And the way to get information about them is to do the surveys. Other countries have the surveys to which I referred, especially the survey of living conditions. Let's find out all the parameters of suffering that they're experiencing. Let's find out. So we need to have that done, and then we need to have collate the information, and analyze the information, and create policy on that. Right? And so we need the, the first and most important capital asset that these people need is education, a good education. Why is it that some kids have that as a matter of course, but they don't? That's a political question, I'm a, I'm, I'm, that's a human question. It is simply wrong and may even be illegal as well for children of that age to be denied a good primary school education. It is wrong for them when they grow up not to have assets that they can use to create wealth in their communities. Yes, while other young people do. Somebody has to intervene. And so we, we, need, we need to have capital assets focused on by the government. And I am suggesting, because I was asked to do the presentation, that the 2021 budget must speak to the renovation of these communities. Yes? In a way that no previous budget has. People talk generally, the ministers of finance talk generally about what they need to do. And they do that because they themselves have not done the research. But we want focus on the disadvantaged communities. And we want the, the communities themselves to be assisted in managing themselves in the way that I have suggested. Now I am passionate about that because as I said, nobody realizes that Dr. James has been a teacher for most of his adult life, yeah? I have taught kids, and I've taught kids of different abilities. And I know just as my childhood was, was pretty decent where that is concerned, every parent wants their child, right, to have something like that. But too many kids are cut off. And I want to say again, somebody said it before, I think it's Joe, or is it um, Kerwin? that COVID is a wake-up call. Because what it has done is to expose some of the deficiencies in the way we govern ourselves. The huge um, gaps between the fortunes of one community and the other cannot be sanctioned, should not be sanctioned. And so I am raising my voice in this forum um, about the, pla the, the plea, the plight of, of these kids, right? And I'm thinking we cannot just every year allow them to continue that way, right? It's got to change. And I finally want to say I love Kerwin's fund. Kerwin's fund, and maybe we can have a chat. Been wanting to have a chat with him, but he has been so elusive, Madam Co-Chair. <laughs> uh, maybe he senses that I probably don't have enough. Um, but he himself has not done his research if he is thinking along those lines. But I like the idea, seriously, of the fund, the investment fund there. Um, 
and I could take a conversation with him and involve my credit union and myself in that enterprise. Thank you, Karen, for you know raising the question of that of the, the that particular contract and how egregious it was, you know, and um, the the fact that they are not getting the legislation passed in different aspects, which you find a mystery. I find it a mystery too. And um, <clears throat> we need civil society to speak out, I think, more on that matter, right? I enjoyed your com company, um, ladies and gentlemen. So thanks for listening to me rant, as I have been doing in these closing remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. James. Uh, and I, of course, not that I omitted that cap of a teacher, but it's so many. I had to just sift through the, those available for this morning. So thank you very much. And um, next, I'd like to invite Cohen Valley um, just to bring your closing remarks as we thank close you, thank this you, session. Yeah. Dr. James, I, I am confident that my head of investor services and distribution will challenge you on that notion of not uh, <laughs> pursuing you. <laughs> and and I would love to have that sit down. I, I actually had a note to say that we could probably have a virtual meal and a drink yeah. sometime. Because yeah. what you talk about with the youth and what we are recommending are not mutually exclusive, but a necessary um, part of the solution in my view, uh, we only win when we all win. Yeah. So yeah. I wanna just, my, my, my parting comments and thank you again, everyone. Every business starts small. It's one of the takeaways I'd like to leave with you. Just like Coca-Cola, every business starts small. Opportunities are there, particularly in this climate, locally, regionally, internationally. Um, the business community must lead. The business community cannot be spectators waiting for government. We welcome government support, but we can. And I think just in the last political exercise we went through, one of the challenges that put a challenge to the business community to effectively adopt a community in Trinidad and Tobago and think about investing in an under-optimized, economically channel, um, challenged re region. You could bring in all sorts of solutions. And we at KCL and Aspire are saying that we are taking that challenge quite seriously. And that's why, Dr. James, I'd like to talk to you more about your thoughts on that. Okay. So the business community must lead. And, and I spoke about community development, but I do think, as the theme has been collaboration, if we work together, we can and will turn our Caribbean dreams into global income streams. So with that, I thank you all again for the invitation and for listening to me. Thank you very Thank much you. for those comments. Thank you very much, Cohen. What are we? And I would like to invite Mrs. Tishera to bring her clues and remarks to this session here this morning. I know she should be on shortly. Yes. Um, am I on? You are. We are hearing you. Not you see. You see me? No, we are not. Okay. See me now? Yes, we are. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I want to thank the Credit Union League and Cipriani College and all my other presenters. It was very um, instructive for me to hear all the points of view. And by the way, Mr. James, we do share something in common. I spend most of my life as a teacher. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, at different levels, but teaching nevertheless, it's the same principle of teaching. Um, I want to end on a perhaps a more optimistic note. I think we said COVID-19 was a game changer. And I think in this sense, I think one of the challenges we have, and I'm speaking as a 
politician, so to speak, and a former cabinet minister being part of the, um, the political body. I think one of the challenges of running Trinidad and Tobago, <clears throat> managing Trinidad and Tobago, is because of what makes us strong, the diversity of our people in terms of religion, ethnicity, etc., cetera, um, makes us strong, but it also makes it challenging to manage. I think the COVID-19 has given the prime minister an opportunity to show strong leadership. And if I am using anecdotal examples, maybe they are, but I think by and large, the national community has been very supportive of him. They have been very supportive of the constant um, the meetings at the conferences he has um, very regularly with his line ministers. And that has helped people, I think, to rally around mm -hmm. Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, there's a crisis, but because he has shown strong leadership. So I say that mm -hmm. to say that the opportunity now lies for him to now do the necessary implementation. He did it with Petrotrin. That was a very, whether you agree with it or not, I'm not going down that line, but it was a definitely a huge decision on his part. And if he could have done that, and, and that he can go forward now with a lot of the implementation projects that have been languishing as a result. He has a lot of opportunities. He has done some of the work already. We've seen hospitals being built, the Curap Interchange being built, the Heritage Restoration Projects, seems to be one of his pet projects. That has also come to pass, and the NIF, National Investment Fund. What we do need to see from him is the implementation of all of those game changer projects to take Trinidad and Tobago mm. to the next level to deal with our foreign exchange reserve issues. And one of the things I personally would like to see is the granting of all those licenses to these franchises that only um, produce low income jobs, use up our foreign exchange. I would like to see a reduction on that. I'd like to see him deal with the issue with the casinos um, definitively. I would also like to see, because I think that is definitely part of the organized crime situation that this country has. And when I listen to Mr. James talk about the poverty and the young people and so on, the reality is that as long as the drug trade, and we know exactly what kind of drug trade we are talking about, is part and parcel of our landscape, there's no education, there's no CPEP job, there's no URP job. There's no low income franchise job that can ever compete, ever compete with the returns that those communities, which are essentially, essentially along the, the, the urban communities. You don't hear about it in, in Toko. You don't hear about it in Maruga. You don't hear about it in Point Portin. It is an illness that is, is symptoms are found along East West Corridor. And the day I see the prime minister of this country take a real strong position with regard to dealing with organized crime, starting with closing down those casinos, dealing with the illegal immigration of Venezuela, because there's no question, you read the papers, they either involve, I'm not saying all, but enough of them, in either prostitution, um, scamming, murder, most recently they involved in murder. And I think the, the commissioner of police talked about the head of Evander, um, was one of the most um, dangerous gangs, was found and killed in Trinidad. So until the prime minister is willing to deal with the issue of the illegal entry of those um, Venezuelans in the country while they close down the borders and they're entering along the southwest, and until he's willing to deal with that, until he's willing to deal with the proliferation of casinos in this country, until he's willing to stop the DPP, properly is 57 percent understaffed and set up a special unit just to deal with white collar crime until i see those steps dealing because i, I don't know if you know it's about 10 billion this year was lot was less 10 billion dollars every year going into national security that should be going into all other areas and until i see that decision made by the prime minister 
and to deal more comprehensively will not the effects or the symptoms of crime on the East-West Corridor, but the cause of the crime in this country. And I see the disruption in the trade. Up to now, I have not seen, with all due respect to the Commission of Police, all due respect to the Commission of Police, and please don't send me a horrible message on Facebook or however they do it, right? I'm speaking the facts. Until I see the Commission of Police get a cocaine shipment, not the Spanish captain, not the Americans out there out on the sea. Until I see that coming from us here, all of this talk that Mr. Winford James talks about with the with the with the youth and so on, you are spinning top in mud yeah. because you yeah. cannot compete yeah, with that top. Yeah. And my Listen. final statement, therefore, that the prime minister has the has the um, the goodwill of the people of Toronto and Tobago, but until I see him deal comprehensively and say with the crime in this country, which we all know where it's coming from, and he deals with that, this country we are not going to move forward. And that is my personal views on that and moving forward. I see Mr. James nodding his head, but that is how I that is my views on that. I just want to just say this, Carol, that yes, um, Mr. James. the advantage and nature of the communities predates the coming of the Venezuelans and the casinos. Oh, no, I'm not saying yes, but it's going on quite a while. And that just exas you use the word today. Uh -huh. You that's use the word did. today, exacerbated a situation. I didn't say they caused it. They and we all know the problem. And, and what is very unfortunate, what is very, very unfortunate is that you see a whole community of people being labeled like that, but they are not the cause, they are the symptom of the problem. And until the government is willing to deal with the cause and not the symptoms, we will be having this discussion next year and next year and next year and the budget, by the way, and we should not have any private sector entity involved in our national security. When I see the government get serious about that, then I will become a believer. Great. Thank and you that very was much. A little bold on my part. I don't want anybody sending me Facebook messages. <laughs> in, in, please, this era, in this please, era. Please, no I, Facebook messages cutting me out. <laughs> <laughs> in this era, as we were having a conversation just the day before, these are some of the new occupational hazards. So as you make your comments, like on social media, you know, we have a very active community there. But thank you very much for your contribution here this morning. You're welcome. I, yeah, we really appreciate it. And and on my be behalf, on the behalf of the Board of Governors of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, and our director, Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry, I would like to thank the Cooperative Credit Union League, Mr. Remy, Ms. Joseph and company, and each and every one, thank you for including the Cipriani College here in this discussion forward. We have committed to working along with our stakeholders, and we have committed to the economic and social empowerment of the working class. And forums like these allow us to fulfill our mandate and move positively along our strategic direction. The college continues to commit to the education of the credit union movement. And it was touched upon by each and every presenter here this morning. Currently, enrollment is open. We are taking persons as well as we have open courses available. And yes, Ms. Joseph, that is a shameless plug. So I will not miss that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I will not miss the opportunity to advance education within the credit union movement, particularly as it forms part of our philosophical underpinnings. And I would like to thank the presenters. Each and every one of these forums have been in a lot of webinars over the, the COVID period, quote unquote. And I must admit, these forums are world class and we must admit it. 
and the league has taken this initiative as a pre-budget forum to bring another world-class presentation to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as our regional participants. It was really enlightening. I mean, I'm boosting now to go and, you know, really engage in further discussion, you know, and it's not a matter of my size, but a matter of the euphoria and, you know, the, the excitement I have within. So thank you very much for being a part of this. We look forward to further collaboration in all spheres of the development of, pe of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and for working people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. And as I prepare to have the final closing comments, I want to say thank you to all our presenters, Mr. Shera, my mentor, Dr. Winford James, and uh, Mr. Kerwin Valley, along with my own president, Mr. Joseph Remy. This has been a very productive morning, and we have heard so much coming from all of us that if we pool those resources together, we can certainly turn around Trinidad and Tobago. We all have a passion for what is happening in our country, and it is very important for our leaders at the national government level to include civil society to a larger extent so that we can contribute to governance, good leadership, and the strategic direction of Trinidad and Tobago, which will, at the end of the day, redound to the benefit of all of us, our families, and our people. We need to, as leaders, to understand that we don't have all the answers. And we need to put aside our pride or our egos and include other people who may have the answers outside in society and consider them so that at the end of the day, we will be a better people. All of us will really be able to say at that point in, in our life, that every creed and race find an equal place because there are many who at this time is singing a different song. They don't feel that they belong, but we want our people to feel that they truly belong. So thank you so much once again, Pat, our presenters. Thank you so much, Colin, for all your hard work. It was nice co-chairing with you and working with you to see the, the success of this forum today. And I pray now for the safety of our families and uh, for all of us, and that we will see post-COVID and our future years will be better than those that we have passed. Thank you so much and God bless everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much and goodbye everyone. Everyone, goodbye. Take care, all the best to the co